Welcome everybody to today's webinar. We're excited. We're going to be talking today about sales acceleration, practical AI empowering the sales experience. And to do that, um, we've brought on a special guest, which I will have him introduce himself here in just a second, but I want to make sure all of you jump in. I want this to be engaging. We want you to be part of the conversation. So please go to the Q&A box on your system, type your name and where you're from, um, as we want to know who you are and some of the questions you have. Um, while that comes in, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker today, um, Mike Judd, who is joining us from Frost and Sullivan. Mike, thanks so much for joining. My pleasure. So, Mike, um, one, I probably won't do a great, I, I, I probably won't do a great introduction. Maybe you can take just a minute, introduce, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do over there at Frost and Sullivan. Sure. Um, well, I'm the research manager for our big data and analytics practice. Uh, this is a uh, significant practice for uh, Frost and Sullivan. Uh, we consider it a growth initiative. And so in the uh, last few years, we've been uh, radically expanding our coverage, uh, looking at a lot of different verticals. And uh, in the course of doing that, uh, we realized that uh, uh, advanced analytics are basically evolving into uh, AI-powered uh, analytics. And uh, so that got us really excited. And since AI is something that we do cover, uh, we've been writing reports uh, on the subject and discovered that uh, AI is, uh, you know, has a mystique about it. Uh, for many people, it's, uh, you know, it's a, a sort of an impractical goal to, uh, uh, to deploy. And so we were looking at examples of uh, uh, products, analytics that uh, in, incorporate AI so that uh, the overhead on the, uh, the users are uh, minimized. And so consequently, uh, we were looking at inside sales, and uh, that's uh, how I became part of this uh, webinar. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, yeah, it's a fascinating topic, and I know the audience is interested to tune on in here. Looks like we've got a number of people joining. We've got Tim coming in from Florida. We've got Mary coming in from California. Pete, David, John. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. I think this will be a real good turnout as we talk about AI. Now, that's Mike. Real quick about myself. I'm Gabe Larson. I run our growth team. That's our, our sales, um, I've got sales and marketing responsibilities over at InsideSales.com. And for those of you who don't know too much about Inside Sales, we help companies build more qualified pipeline and close more deals with the help of AI, which we'll be talking about a little bit today. So Mike, um, I wanna just set this up right. I know you guys had started with some research, big picture on what's going on in the market. Maybe we can start there as we start talking about AI and, and what the landscape looks like. Uh, sure, Gabe. Uh, let's let's go ahead and do that. Um, you know, uh, at Frost and Sullivan, our uh, pronouncements always start with uh, primary data, and so for any of our practices, we like to have a handle on what's going on in the market uh, to just gauge, you know, what uh, potential users are are considering or what their concerns are. So uh, this year, we did a, a big data and analytics survey. Uh, it was uh, North American. And uh, uh, we had something in excess of uh, 400 respondents and uh, basically basically tried to delve into what was driving uh, concerns and, uh, and uh, you know, their, their plans for the future. And so one of the things that we found that was, we found really interesting, because we ask about artificial intelligence, and one of the uh, agree-disagree questions that we had in the survey was, uh, you know, artificial intelligence will define the next wave of IT automation. And you can see here that uh, virtually, uh, virtually a uh, uh, you know uh, an absolute uh, majority coverage or uh, you know virtually 100% indicated that uh, they either strongly agreed or they were at this point neutral. Uh, so if we can count the fact that uh, you're always going to have a certain percentage that say that they're uh, that they're neutral on anything. Uh, we only had about 3% that disagreed. So, uh, you know, this indicates a, um, 
you know, a, a very high resonance with the market on, on artificial intelligence. It seems like everybody is, is keen on, uh, you know, exploring the possibilities for this new technology. And then we have another couple of bullet points here on the side, you know, um, uh, you know, CEOs, 56% of the CEOs we talked to uh, said that intelligent data analytics will be a key driver of business growth. And uh, that's something that Frost and Sullivan very firmly believes. Uh, you know, we believe that, uh, you know, this, this AI movement will fundamentally transform how we do computing in the future. Um, a little bit more on that in a bit. 45% um, of CEOs say competitors use intelligent uh, data analytics uh, you know, uh, it, it's basically, you know, if you're not doing it and your, uh, your competitors are, uh, then uh, you've got a problem. And then, uh, you know, the 22% of CEOs say they plan to leverage artificial intelligence. And, uh, you know, and 82% of IT decision makers in say integrated intelligence is an important decision factor in their choice of a cloud solution partner. And this, this is an important point, too, and it's something that we will talk about in a few slides. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, real quick, um, just a question for you, um, sure, Mike, is uh, as we go through this, because we've done a couple webinars on artificial intelligence, and um, I feel like sometimes people struggle a little bit with the definition, you know, what is it and, and how does it work? And we had one question come in from Pete. Or Peter, sorry, Peter, um, and just kind of saying, what is the definition of, of AI from so Frost and Sullivan's standpoint? Is, is it differ a lot from some of these other words we hear, like advanced analytics or data analytics? Can you kind of explain what you mean by AI or how that works in your guys' world? <laughs> That's an excellent question because uh, obviously there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace about what AI means. Um, uh, you know, just because AI, somebody says that there's AI in a product doesn't necessarily mean that there is. Um, you know, we, uh, we classify AI as an enabler of advanced analytics. Uh, you know, analytics have been around, you know, purpose-built analytics have been around for ages. Uh, they date way back into, uh, you know, the, the uh, dark recesses of computer science. Uh, the, uh, basically, uh, the way we view uh, uh, AI is that it's a class of advanced analytics that uh, it allows one to extract meaning from very large data sets. Uh, you know, typically that means something that incorporates machine learning. And, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that in a slide or two. But, uh, but you know, essentially it is uh, built-in intelligence. And let's see here. Uh, so the, the next slide is something that I threw in as, uh, you know, basically eye candy for people uh, to, uh, you know, just sort of reinforce the fact that AI is... Uh, you know, very big, and it's going to get very much bigger very quickly. Uh, as you can see, you know, by uh, the year 2025, which is as far out as our projections go, uh, the market, uh, global market for AI products and services could be anywhere from 20 billion to above 55 billion uh, oh. dollars. And, you know, that's a substantial market. Uh, the reason you see three lines here is because at Frost and Sullivan, we we don't like to be tied down to a particular uh, number, you know, 20 years in the future. I mean, that, that's disingenuous and it, uh, you know, it leads to a lot of confusion when people start debating decimal points. Instead, what we do is we look at the uh, sort of the probability of outcomes and we build that into our forecast. So you can see that, you know, even at a minimum, you know, the minimum uh, global forecast is, is something over $20 billion. So it's a substantial market. And, um, you know, we may even be conservative in our estimates, so we think it's a big deal. Okay, uh, any discussion of AI uh, has to start with, you know, basically, so why AI? Um, you know, we, we talk about um, the information age. I mean, all of us use that term. It's, it's become, uh, you know, hackneyed with use. You know, we assume that we're somehow in the post-information age. Uh, you know, but in actual fact, if you think about it, we've we've never actually had an information age. Uh, you know, early computers were associated with processing data, called automated data processing, and uh, you know, we we learned how to 
uh, manipulate data, create data, store data, uh, transfer data. So we're real, uh, real good. We're all experts at data management and, uh, you know, the, the notion of what do you do com with computers to, uh, to, to use data. But in fact, uh, data is not information. Um, you know, data is, uh, you know, simply a collection of facts. Uh, and as we like to point out here, uh, up until now, information has simply been a function of what goes on between two people's ears. If you present people with enough data, uh, they uh, look at it, they analyze it, uh, and then they draw conclusions from it. Those conclusions uh, are basically the information, uh, the meaning of the data set. Um, the problem, the problem with that approach, uh, which, by the way, got us a long ways in, in uh, you know, IT. Uh, but the but the problem with that approach is that all of the information generation, all of the insights come from uh, people's uh, review of data. Um, so, what broke the bank? You know, big data came along. All of a sudden, we can generate more data than we know what to do with. We can generate data sets that are vast beyond belief. You know, we've even had to come up with new architectures to store all of this data, and. And you just really can't use it effectively anymore. So how do you generate that context now when the data is, is simply overwhelming? You have to have something like artificial intelligence, something that's been trained to look for relationships so it can bring that to the attention of, of people. Uh, we're in the process of building a true information age. Uh, we're on the we're on the verge of a true information age where artificial intelligence partners with people to extract meaning, um, and where uh, the paradigm of computing changes fundamentally. So it's an exciting time to be involved in IT. Uh, it'll transform all of our jobs, uh, but at the same time, I think it'll raise uh, you know computing to a higher level, and and make it much more valuable to the bottom line of uh, corporations. Quick cu couple of cu questions coming in here, um, Mike, that I think might be interesting to just pop if, if that's okay. Um, we've got two people. One, Susan, I think this is probably worded the best, so I'll go with this one. The idea is just basically, uh, and I, th I think it fits in here, a lot of people talking about AI, a lot of vendors talking about AI, a lot of companies talking about, about AI. Um, you've talked a little bit about data, you talked a little bit about the algorithms associated with it. Is there something that um, makes something more real when it comes to uh, AI versus, you know, not real AI? Um, well, it's a point that we make, and in fact, it may be on one of the slides coming up, but, uh, you know, just because something says it's AI doesn't mean it's AI. Um, uh, you know, obviously, there are very complex algorithms, uh, you know, what we call purpose-built uh, purpose analytics, where you know you have uh, essentially programmers coming up with a way to uh, statically analyze data and uh, you know essentially do correlations uh, amongst data sets and and extract some some meaning that way uh, you know the once again the the problem with that is that it's it's a static model uh, it's a program that you've uh, programmed to uh, extract uh, some uh, uh, some data points, even you know maybe draw some conclusions from it. Uh, but at the same time, you know because it's static, it can't it can't take into account new uh, new situations. It can't learn from uh, the way the data is trending. Um, you know so. You know, essentially, it's the difference between being able to have a, a motion picture uh, that uh, changes over time, that uh, tells you what's going on, uh, to a uh, a bunch of static snapshots that uh, you know you basically run a routine, uh, maybe in a business intelligence application, and it gives you a chart, but it doesn't really. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't really uh, look at whether that chart makes any sense in the context of the data as it is now. And as we all know, uh, one of the fundamentals of big data is that, uh, you know, this data is not static. It's coming at us at warp speed. Uh, and, and uh, you know, artificial intelligence can cope with that because it's, it learns and it self-modifies. A static, uh, a static uh, application can't learn, and ultimately, if the data set changes enough, uh, the answers you get out of a, a static approach uh, simply stop making any sense. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. 
Uh, you indicated you had two questions. Is, was that the one that you wanted to, to go with? No, I mean, they were similar enough. I tried to kind of summarize it too and take Susan's idea. So I think you've got it. Okay, great. Uh, super. Uh, sometimes I wonder if I'm giving the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. I like it. Uh, so this one here, uh, this slide here is uh, also a little bit of eye candy, but I think it's, I think it's kind of profound in a way. Uh, this gives you a sense of where we've been with AI and uh, things like machine intelligence, and uh, you know basically where we're going. So if you take a look at um, if you take a look at uh, the history of AI, we've had uh, AI almost as long as we've had uh, uh, computer systems. Uh, you know, even in the very early days of you know the earliest digital computers, people were speculating on. I wonder if these things are going to evolve and take over the world. A lot of great science fiction from the early days dealt with that very subject, um, but in actual fact, uh, in actual fact, uh, you know, people when they saw what uh, a digital processor could do, all, almost uh, immediately started thinking in terms of wonder if these things can become independent. And so, if you take a look at you know from like 1943 to 52, the earliest days days of digital computers, uh, you know, McCullough and Pitts. You know, they came up with a theory of neurons and said, you know, boy, th this looks like a this looks like a computer gate. You know, maybe we can do something with that. Uh, you know, have the heavy and learning process. You know, which is, you know, how do you learn? Uh, is there a feedback loop involved in that? Can that be simulated in the digital processor? Uh, you know, really, in about 1956, the term artificial intelligence uh, came about. Uh, Mark McCarthy's uh, work uh, speculated on that. Um, and by that time, we were looking at fairly substantial digital computers, and so people were really excited about this. Uh, you know, there was uh, uh, there was a uh, you know a huge uh, uh, you know wave of people doing uh, basic research into artificial intelligence, and there were predictions that said, you know, boy, by the time uh, by the time we get done with this, you know, very early in the 20th century, uh, machines are going to be running everything, and uh, we'll be able to talk to them. Uh, you see this, uh, it's actually kind of interesting that this is the 50th anniversary of uh, the uh, uh, science fiction uh, movie, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And you can see exactly in that what people thought computers would be like uh, by the turn of the century. Uh, the HAL 9000 computer, artificially intelligent, in fact so intelligent that it actually had a, a nervous breakdown. And, uh, you know, obviously that didn't happen because it turned out that uh, between around the late 60s and uh, mid 70s, uh, there was a serious dose of reality. We, that's when we discovered that, uh, you know, simple uh, computers, uh, mainframe computers with limited memory, uh, really couldn't do artificial intelligence. Uh, it was really beyond their capability, and uh, there was this uh, this huge you know, turning away from AI with the notion that, well, this is all just science fiction and it's going to remain that way. There were projections at that time that said it'll be 200, 300 years before we see anything practical coming out of AI. But in the meantime, people were developing things like knowledge-based systems, which was uh, an attempt to codify people's knowledge and uh, build that into a supercomputer program. Uh, you know, at the, around that time, Campbell Soup Company uh, tried to codify all the rules associated with uh, making chicken noodle soup so that they could, uh, you know, basically have peopleless factories making chicken noodle soup. Um, that worked out fairly well, uh, and we came to a whole new class of computing systems that uh, tried to incorporate knowledge bases. Um, you know, so, so what happened after that? Yeah, basically, uh, progress continued, and Moore's Law, the, uh, you know, gave us more and more capable computers. Uh, Supercomputers came into their own right, and people started playing with AI again, uh, to the point where AI became essentially an industry, and it still is. You know, AI is, uh, you know, the application of, uh, you know, uh, learning, machine learning to various, uh, you know, various processes. Uh, we also developed a new science around AI. Uh, you know, we, we came to understand that AI was uh, machine learning or deep learning, which is 
you know, another way of, uh, you know, parsing up uh, layers of logic so that machine learning can be applied to each of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, we saw the emergence of intelligent agents. Uh, with the emergence of, of intel intelligent agents, we finally came to an area that, that uh, it's Frost and Sullivan we call practical AI. And, you know, practical AI was this notion that, uh, you know, now we're building products that don't require uh, PhD computer scientists to, to make them work. Uh, because a lot of a lot of large businesses do use uh, AI like things and they have internal labs that create these things and they're very proprietary they won't even talk to us about what they're doing with it uh, you know so we're, we're really interested in uh, things that incorporate AI principles and and technology and provide practical results to people where you don't have to build a laboratory to get it to work. And that brings, uh, brings us to the notion of applying AI to large data applications like sales. Uh, you know, sales operations generate lots of data, you know, uh, typically look at lots of different data sets and try and make sense of all of that to, to enable the sales process. And, you know, we think that, uh, you know, we're finally reaching that point where, you know, practical AI is, is appearing in this space. And, and so it's very exciting to us. Do you, do you feel, yeah, do you feel like real quick, Mike, um, and I'm kind of saving the questions as they come in just for the, you know, for the end of these slides. Um, one good question here from Tom just said, you know, I think he's kind of looking at this slide and saying, AI becomes more of an industry, you know, 1986 to, you know, 2000. It, it seems like sales is, is, I don't know if it's slow, but it appears to be slower to the game. Like this has been talked about for, you know, the last four or five years. Why is sales, you know, it, it, it does seem like it's emerging into sales. Is that for a reason? Is sales just slow to catch up or is it just really emerging in every industry as we speak? Well, I think uh, to a certain extent, it's emerging in, in every industry. Um, uh, you know, there are some that have adopted it faster than others. I would say that, uh, you know, it was a technological thing. Uh, you know, sales is a much more complex environment than many uh, areas where you would apply AI. Uh, like I say, the, the data that you're looking at is very dynamic. Um, it depends upon, you know, assessing uh, sales, uh, uh, sales, um, you know, uh, markets, uh, you know, uh, sales opportunities, and uh, you know, doing that in almost real time, and uh, you know, that's that's something that uh, you know is really is 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 really hard to do. Uh, so I think that it's it's a instance of you know we had two things we have much better hardware, you know, Moore's law is uh, delivering extremely huge. Uh, capabilities both on the desktop and in the cloud and we've got much much better software uh, you know like I said you know AI became a science uh, you know a few years ago and so the under our understanding of how machine learning works and how uh, uh, you know how you build machine learning into an application uh, that has uh, that has improved exponentially and I think those two things came together and now we can consider things like uh, sales, um, you know, acceleration. Uh, whereas before, maybe we could do it, but maybe you needed to have a, uh, you know, a huge IT staff just trying to keep the thing running. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so next slide here. Um, you know, like I said, so, you know, here we are. Uh, we've got the, you know, as Ghostbusters would have said once upon a time, we've got the tools and we've got the talent. Uh, we've got an opportunity to, uh, you know, apply uh, AI capabilities to sales, and uh, you know, in the sense that sales is a complex frontier, uh, and and you know, amongst many out there, uh, you know, this is uh, a next frontier for AI. You know, it's uh, you know taking on something that's real world, practical, uh, near real time, and uh, is uh, you know is is a real opportunity. Um, uh, you know, so we can see this wave developing. Um, and but why is this? You know, we talk about in Frost and Sullivan, we talk about hyper competition. Uh, you know, hyper competition means that uh, with a global marketplace and with uh, everybody able to participate in every other person's market, uh, you know, uh, market niches, opportunities are uh, you know. It, it, 
basically appearing at an increasingly accelerated pace. Um, you know, 84% of our survey uh, say, say that speed is vital to preserve brand value. In other words, if you're not out there identifying the opportunities and, uh, you know, we'll use the term exploit, exploiting those opportunities, um, then you're going to be left behind. And it doesn't, you know, in today's markets, it doesn't take very many uh, misses uh, to threaten the business. Yep, yep. To uh, identify and employ market niches, uh, you know, you have to have effective sales uh, organizations. Uh, one of the things that we joke about uh, at Frost and Sullivan is that, uh, you know, if you had a really good sales organization, a really good marketing organization, you could, as a company, you could almost outsource everything else and and make it work in today's, uh, you know, very uh, distributed production environment. Uh, you know, so so having a first class sales organization is just absolutely a must so that you can build a pipeline of prospects quickly, identify uh, opportunities, build relationships with those pros prospects uh, that you can carry across to the next, uh, you know, the next product that you bring out. Um, you must have access to and be able to use, utilize existing data effectively. Uh, you know, you can't wait around anymore for, uh, say, the IT department to look at a data set and write a few routines and, uh, you know, look it over and debug it and then come back and give you an answer. By that time, you know, two or three weeks have passed and maybe your niche is gone and maybe you've missed a significant opportunity. So what's required is a solution set that accelerates the sales process so that you can meet the market at the speed it's moving in. And this means sales acceleration. So as, as we sort of discussed before, you know, sales acceleration uh, depends upon uh, analyzing data, extracting meaning from it uh, at, at warp speed. And uh, so, you know, that, that in itself sort of implies AI, but the sales environment is a big data environment. There's lots of data arriving in near real time, sometimes in real time. I mean, uh, sometimes sales is looking at, uh, you know, what's coming off the production line as well. So uh, you have to have an approach that allows you to uh, manipulate and assess that data, uh, extract meaning from it very, very quickly. Uh, it's too much data for a human to correlate effectively. Uh, there have been jokes in the past about people who say, "Just give me a, just give me a graph, and I can make sense out of all the data that you've got." Uh, that's sort of the fundamental basis for uh, business intelligence applications, uh, but it's not true anymore. Uh, uh, you know, a simple picture, uh, you know, a pretty picture, isn't really going to tell you what's going on. You know, unless you know what the context is, and, and unless you know how that changes over time. Um, you know, identifying which prospects are most likely to purchase, that changes depending upon people's proclivity to purchase anything. And it may even change based upon their relationship with the company. All of that's data that you need to take into account. Um, you know, tracking interactions to help refine the pipeline. Uh, you know, which which relationships are worth maintaining? You know, perhaps uh, one of your biggest clients uh, now uh, has decided to go into a different line of business and they don't, they're not really interested in your products anymore, but there's another up and coming company that, you know, is desperate for the products that you're selling. You know, being able to see that is essential to maintain revenue flow and to uh, you know, match the market's uh, requirements and expectations. So that tells us, you know, there's a need for a practical AI solution uh, that enables sales acceleration, that one that doesn't require a whole lot of uh, modification or customization to make it work and to produce uh, you know, outcomes that are actionable. Yeah, Mike, Mike this question's probably fitting here. Um, this one's coming from Karen, and you, you hit on it, but maybe you, maybe you could just double click, because some people, and Karen, I think, alludes to this, is they've got kind of a BI tool, and they are looking at data, and they're visualizing data. Um, um, you know, and, and her question is like, well, is, is that, that's obviously not AI, but in some cases, I feel like that's enough. When you think of kind of BI versus you know, BI versus AI, I guess, the difference is, you know, that advanced analytics and kind of the ongoing analysis or what, what is the difference between those and why do you need the AI is, is kind of the next step? Right. Um, well, it's a, it's a legitimate and actually an excellent question because, you know, many of the uh, BI providers now are starting to look at incorporating AI into their, their products. And, you know, some already have, 
uh, to, a, to a certain extent. But, you know, once again, um, uh, you know, think about the BI process. Uh, you have uh, data scientists, they write routines to extract data, uh, they uh, generate charts, and uh, they, you know, those charts are available to the decision makers in the company. Uh, they are, uh, you know, some of them, uh, some of the people, uh, you know, just look at the charts, other people uh, get to uh, play with the parameters on the charts a little bit. Uh, but, you know, if you think about that, that is a uh, time-intensive process. You're actually applying people to the process of imagining, you know, what uh, correlations might be legitimate. You know, maybe they're using analytic tools to extract some of those correlations. Then they're, uh, you know, generating charts or uh, reports, and then those are analyzed. That's too much time, and it's, it's, it's honestly, honestly, it's too expensive. Uh, you know, when you have, uh, you know, when you have a process that fundamentally depends upon a bunch of people uh, doing, uh, you know, statistical things uh, with data that's rapidly becoming uh, less than real time, uh, then you've got a problem, really. And so that's why the BI people are looking at AI. Um, and it's why uh, if you don't have to go through all of that to begin with, uh, you're better off. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so. Anyway, uh, another piece of eye candy here. Uh, companies want AI-empowered sales, uh, so we, uh, you know, we ask people why use advanced analytics, and we make it clear that uh, this includes AI applications. Um, and you'll see that uh, one of the top ten is to increase sales. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of these other points, though, if you think about it really have to do with sales as well. You know, the, the number one thing is to make better strategic plans and decisions. Well, you know, a lot of that is, you know, where do we apply our uh, you know, sales personnel? Where do we apply our marketing to re, uh, produce the best results in, in revenue? Uh, you know, improving uh, internal business processes. You know, once again, you know, sales is a business process. And, uh, uh, you know, so, all of these things are interlinked. It's you know they're they're probably not all that discreet. It's just the way we ask the question. But you know even the way we ask the question, increasing sales is a top of mind uh, outcome for employing AI. So uh, you know once again, you know our survey data supports the notion that uh, where we need to go is AI. Interesting. Next slide. Increase sales. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, I guess I'll turn it over to you, Gabe, uh, for uh, some examples of how, uh, uh, you know, inside sales is actually applying all this wonderful stuff that I've been talking about to uh, uh, to improve, improve the sales process. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, Mike. Interesting setup. And I think the I, I think the logical next question for people is, how do I turn this into a reality? How do I kind of take this concept of practical AI and actually apply it to my sales to actually accelerate them? And so as we've talked with Mike and Frost and Sullivan and some of their research, uh, this concept of being able to now uh, actually put it into a system and put it into action uh, becomes very real here. So I'm just going to throw this up quickly. I had two case studies that, as Mike and I were talking about, seem to fit this notion of practical AI. Where are clients, where are people or companies using AI in a way that can actually drive results for your company. And so I'm gonna talk here briefly about CenturyLink. We've been working with them for a while now and I'll go through this concept of problem solution impact. See if I can't set up um, how these guys actually went about doing what they do best, which is increase their sales. So when it came to them, they started with uh, this concept of low sales rep activity. Um, I think this is a big problem across sales. It's, there's never a magic formula. There's never a silver bullet for sales. Oftentimes it is just more active. You know, you got to do more and you have to do it better. Um, and when you do that, um, that's, Sometimes that is kind of the magic sauce. So CenturyLink was having a struggle getting this rep activity up and moving in the right direction. In addition to that, this concept of lead prioritization. Um, as different things came in, whether they were accounts or contacts, which people should they attack? It seemed like it was more of a um, non-scientific exercise. It was just what every sales rep thought and there was a feel for management that they could prioritize 
things more effectively. So what they ended up doing is partnering with InsideSales.com, and I'm moving to the solution section here, um, and they grabbed our productivity tool. Now what we did is we combined our productivity tool with this notion of AI and scoring those entities, those accounts or contacts. So what basically happens is when an entity would appear in the salesperson's queue, um, it would have a score associated with some indication as to why it was scored in a certain way. Now what was behind that score was a couple great factors, certainly demographic and firmographic and intent data, different things as to people, why they're doing certain things. But we add in this other layer we call cross-company data and that is what other companies like you are doing or focusing on in order to win. Think of it like Waze for sales. If you've ever used the navigation app Waze, um, it's not just what a system thinks is the best route from A to B. It actually is crowdsourced. It's what other people have experienced and that, that crowdsourced data, that combined data lake, gives you the optimal route from A to B. And boy, when it comes to AI and sales, we're finding that one of the key factors we're seeing is this added layer of cross-company data and the analysis in real time that we can put in in order to give you that real accurate concept of a score and why that scored so that people can focus on it. So you've got the tool and you've got the AI. And then uh, the great thing is trying to combine those two together um, so that you have an entity with a recommendation and then a tool that can actually serve up and say, hey, you should follow this recommendation because as we analyze this, this is what we need you to do in order to move forward and be successful. So that was kind of the base concept, some fun visibility or reporting into what is working or what's not working. And this is a problem in the spaces. People might be in implementing some of these tools. Um, you know, AI, they may be implementing some data pieces, but they're not, how do I see the benefits or how do I track that? And so want to find a very clear way to see, oh my goodness, this is the benefit of following recommended actions or not. And then lastly, um, the impact was fantastic. You can see there on the right hand side. Um, and th the great thing is if you follow this through, it isn't just a boost in activities. Um, it actually gets to the bottom line. It gets to numbers that matter, the pipeline, the quota, the revenue, et cetera. And so I think that can be extremely powerful. Now I want to show a quick visualization, but maybe as I do that, um, two quick questions uh, from the audience. One from Jack. Jack, let me see if I can deal with this first uh, and, and then I'll jump into my next slide. Jack's basically asking the concept around how do you get reps to follow um, recommendations from the system? Sales reps don't often do that. This is probably, Jack, this is like the universal problem. Um, it is something that I think as companies go on this journey, just getting people to follow recommended actions is um, extremely difficult. The interesting thing, Jack, is when you look at the B2C market, um, we're more attuned to that, right? When you jump into Netflix, you're more likely to maybe take some of the recommendations of that engine. When you go, when you go to Amazon and you buy something, um, you're more likely to take some of those uh, recommendations. But you're right, when it comes to sales and sales reps, we still feel like we know better. So I think there's two things on that, Jack. One is being able to help people understand what it is, um, meaning how did he actually come up with that score? It's very difficult to just see something and say, this is, you know, a, you know, a 72.5. It's like, what does a 72.5 mean? So one, I think provide a little bit of uh, flavor around it. Number two, it is actually this concept that I mentioned, embedding it into a recommendation engine. If a score is just sitting by itself, but there's nothing that encourages me to follow it, I, I think I'm less likely to do that. So merging recommendations into kind of a productivity tool like what, what we've got here at Inside Sales takes a score and then actually brings it to the rep so that there is a way to take the score and an action it. And, and I think that's very helpful. And then number three, I know I said two, but one more popped in. <laughs> Sorry, Jack. Uh, but the last one is just that visibility. If you can actually then show afterwards what happens when you do follow recommendations versus not, 
fairly soon, I think sales reps will start to understand that and be able to kind of apply it in a more structured manner. So I wanted to just highlight this real quick for CenturyLink, and then I'll go back to this other case study. Um, you can see that, and I th there's a couple things I wanted to hit here. The thing that I think is very powerful is this notion of having AI follow you throughout the sales process. And you can see that as you start to follow the AI recommendations as the, is they did at CenturyLink, and sometimes it's as simple as that first, that first step, right? 73% AI adoption, 73% of rep activities correspond with AI recommendations. If you can get that recommendation, watch how kind of it flows through. You see that, that you have better connect rates. You can see that the pipeline gets better. You can see that the close rate gets bigger. And, and lo and behold, you're actually closing more and they're, they're bigger because you're focusing on those that actually want to buy from you. But it starts with that concept of following the recommendation of the, you know, the, the Amazon or the Netflix, or in this case, InsideSales.com. And I'm telling you, big numbers are coming out of following your gut versus following an AI recommended system. So that's one. Let me just throw out one more case study real quick here. Now, this is um, from a communications company and a little bit similar problem here that I wanted to throw out. And then I want to flash something because I think it gets to Jack's point and a couple other questions that are coming in. Um, let me go through it. So these guys had flatline revenue, a little bit similar on the productivity. They had over 200 reps and feeling like, oh my goodness, uh, we're just not getting the value out of our sales team. I love this stat here. 50,000 accounts in CRM that we're rarely engaged with. Um, again, it hits on that prioritization concept. So in this instance, as you look at the solution, this is where I think AI's got to come in and help. And I think this puts a, a, even a more stamp than the CenturyLink. I've got this person who's sitting there and wondering, and, and thou, in, in this case, thousands of entities that I could potentially attack or target. Which ones do I go after? It brings all of them into a pool that actually brings up and then facilitates, these are the ones you wanna go after and why. And again, you can see some of those associated results in not just activities, but in some of those strong numbers like revenue. And I wanna see if I can visualize here um, what that looks like in more of a, a, a tactical, from a tactical standpoint, and then we, we can wrap up here. Um, you, you see this chart here, and this concept is looking at at the bottom two rows, uh, and I'm just gonna flash this here, these bottom two rows, these are AI recommended accounts or contacts. Um, here, these two rows are non-AI recommended accounts or contacts. Now, the beauty of it here is you can actually see as somebody calls one of those AI recommended entities, you can see the associated dollar value that comes from following the recommendation engine. We've actually been able to quantify that into a figure to be able to see how much value each recommended activity brings. And you can see, my goodness, the system says if they're recommended, that you actually should be getting them two, three, four, all the way up to about eight different activities and you can still be getting a lot of value out of that, literally money in your own pocket. Whereas if you go for these non-recommended um, entities, you can see that um, in some cases, I mean, it, it's either very low, um, certainly not even in some cases, you know, one tenth the number that it is if you follow the recommendation engine. So this is the language of sales, you guys. And Jack, this is, I think, the power of being able to get to the why. You've got to show me these types of things. So I, as a sales rep, know that if I follow the Amazon quote unquote recommendation engine, I can have that type of value. And so I wanted to throw that out there. So as we wrap, there's a couple other questions, Mike, um, that I wanted to throw out to the group. A couple for me and one for Mike here, but I did want to flash this. This is the Frost and Sullivan report. Um, if you want to grab, I think there's some great information in here. You can use this bit.ly link. You can also grab it in your resource section. Um, and we would definitely, definitely recommend that. And so I'll leave that open for just a minute. One question coming in for me here, and then Mike, I'll throw one to you. Um, okay. 
And this comes from um, Tom, and Tom basically is just saying, well, Mike, and you may have an opinion on this as well. When it comes to AI, what is one of the biggest challenges companies are facing in order to implement it? Um, I'm, I think I've gotten a little bit of an opinion, but Mike, maybe I'll throw that to you first. Well, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the question is excellent and it drives right to the heart of why we're keen on, uh, as this report says, practical AI. Uh, much of AI out there is uh, not practical for, you know, small companies, uh, even for large companies that are uh, not uh, maintaining huge IT uh, staffs. Uh, you know, the the biggest barrier to adopting AI is that uh, much of it comes untrained, uh, much of it requires customization, and uh, so you might be buying a capability that, uh, you know, out of the box doesn't provide any value to you. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, if you think about lead times, if you think about the investment in, uh, uh, you know, writing code and, uh, you know, assessing the output, because once again, you know, with, uh, with uh, machine learning, oftentimes uh, what it learns isn't uh, necessarily uh, legitimate. Um, you know, so, so there's a lot of overhead that comes with AI uh, currently. Uh, except when you build AI into a product and it basically comes uh, trained out of the box and uh, you know provides good value uh, from day one. So, uh, so you know, our, our our opinion is that AI right now for many companies is a laboratory experiment, yeah. and uh, you know that uh, you know we'll get past that, uh, but it takes leaders like Inside Sales to uh, show a better way. I think. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I think that Tom, that's probably a good enough answer. One more, and, and uh, Mike, both of us can potentially stab this here. Question is just about differentiate, kind of differentiation. Is you talked about a little bit earlier in the in the cast here. A lot of people talking about AI. What makes great AI, or what makes poor AI? You know, in our opinion, um, the thing we're finding is that you know. A lot of people have data scientists, um, and that's not necessarily a huge differentiator. A lot of people, I mean, you can go download some of the algorithms. Um, a lot of people, random forest, whatever it may be, the math part of it, it's not really the sweet spot. What we're finding is this data concept. Um, data plays a very large role, and it's one of the things we feel like is a big differentiator for InsideSales.com is to be able to say, you know, it's, it's hard to do robust AI or big data analysis if you've, you know, you're only closing 12 transactions a year. Um, that's not really, and <laughs> I don't know if that lends itself very well to a lot of analysis. And unfortunately, a lot of enterprise sales teams are finding that, you know, they're not closing 100 million deals a year, right? This isn't Amazon. This is, you know, they've got 100 reps and they're all closing 10 deals. That's not, that's not big data. And so, as we look at different data sets, your own data, external data sources that are available, um, and then this this kind of uh, crowdsourced concept of of merging other people's data together uh, anonym, in an anonymized format to see if we can provide a more robust data set in order to have organizations experience some of the value of AI. That That's kind of where we've gone is one of the big pieces we feel like is missing as we think about enterprise sales and its ability to really be effective with AI. Mike, thoughts on that, or what would you say is one of the some of the keys to a strong AI AI solution? Well, I think that uh, uh, you know there's there, there are lots of analogies you can use. One of them is simply a toaster. Uh, you know, when you buy a toaster at the store, is it a, a box of parts that you have to put together and, you know, sort of optimize to toast bread? Or do you just buy a toaster and it toasts bread and it has some, you know, built-in smarts so that it doesn't, you know, presumably burn your bread? Um, you know, I think that's, that's what distinguishes good AI from bad AI or, you know, less than good AI. It's the fact that, you know, how much involvement do you actually have to have in order to make the thing deliver value? Uh, you know, if, uh, you know, there are many companies that uh, want 
to have you know that sort of fundamental interaction with the uh, artificial intelligence applications and uh, you know when they do that you know they're building uh, proprietary systems that are very strategic and like I said they they simply won't talk to us about those but for most of us you know we don't want to assemble a toaster when we buy a toaster we simply want a toaster that works and you know presumably one that that works really well so um, you know I think that if you just think about other things in your life about um, you know uh, what you like uh, that that actually works for you you'll find that uh, you know simplicity lack, lack of complexity uh, you know it just works that that kind of notion I think is is what's really key to uh, providing AI enabled applications that, that people want and will use Love it. I love it. All right. Well, um, certainly a couple more questions come in. Our time's running short. Uh, I would definitely recommend, again, grab the report. Let's continue the conversation. I think uh, Mike, myself, um, you'll find us on different social applications. Um, grab me on LinkedIn if you'd like to continue the conversation. Mike, if someone would like to reach out to you or learn more about some of the things you guys are doing, what's the best way to do that? Well, I think uh, you, you nailed it. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the uh, best way to grab my attention. And, uh, you know, uh, anybody that wants to talk about this, I'm happy to, uh, to have a discussion with them. Uh, you know, our, our interest, uh, you know, uh, Frost and Sullivan is basically evangelical about technology and applying it to business for good results. And uh, so we're really interested in, uh, you know, promoting, evangelizing really good solutions in the AI, AI space. Uh, so I, I would be very happy to talk to anybody that wants to, uh, to ping me. All righty. Well, hey, again, Mike, thanks so much for joining. Uh, great talk track, real interesting information about AI sales acceleration and how we can turn it into something very real. So again, thanks for joining. For the audience, remember success. It's just one play away.